Welcome to episode 341 of the AMPM podcast. My guest this week is Andrew Morgans. Andrew grew up in Africa, but lives in the U.S. now. He's done quite a bit of travel. Hasn't been to quite as many countries as I have, but he's he's pushing it. He's been to 60 some odd. And today he's one of the top managers of some of the biggest brands in the world when it comes to Amazon, from Nestle to one of the, he got to start with one of the divisions of Adidas, a huge uh, plethora of big name brands. And he is the caretaker for everything they do on Amazon. We're going to talk about that, talk about travel, talk about a whole bunch of really cool stuff in this episode. And don't forget also the Billion Dollar Seller Summit is coming up in June, June 11th to the 15th in San Juan, Puerto Rico. You can go to BillionDollarSellerSummit.com and get information on that. Hopefully I will see you there. But in the meantime, enjoy this episode with Andrew. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast for Money Never Sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Ke- 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 Kevin King. Andrew Morgans, welcome to the AMPM podcast. It's an honor to have you here today. It's an honor to be here. You know, we recently connected and got a chance to meet each other and share a meal. But I have obviously known of of your conferences and your events and uh, obviously your expertise for a long time. So I'm honored to be on the show. I appreciate you coming on, man. I knew your name, but I hadn't put a, a name to the face. Then, like you said, yeah, we were at the out at Prosper, and uh, we went to uh, we got invited to a dinner. I think Paul Barron uh, organized this dinner at this uh, Bazaar Meats, which was a crazy crazy place to uh, to to go and eat. Uh, and then uh, you and I were sitting next to each other, and we we started chatting. And we're like, holy cow, man, we gotta we gotta get on each other's podcasts. Uh, you host a podcast as well, or you're, you're a co-host, I guess. You got a few others uh, uh, all about ecom. What's the name of that podcast? Startup Hustle. Startup Hustle. So uh, for the Amazon community, um, I am one of four hosts. We, we, you know, we post uh, five days a week. So my episodes come out on Tuesday. We, I cover all things e-commerce, Amazon, startups, you know, software, uh, just all the stuff we're doing and, and loving in e-com. Um, but there's a couple other hosts there that co- cover just like software startups, um, uh, nonprofit and, and minority owned businesses. So we kind of cover a variety of topics. Uh, we were at one point we were a uh, top 15, uh, business entrepreneurial podcast in the world, I think last year. So, um, it's growing. It's a lot of fun and, and I'm excited to get you on there as well. Awesome. Yeah. I love to love to come on. Uh, we'll, we'll make that happen. So you've got, you know, you had an interesting background and you were talking uh, when we met at dinner, like you grew up in Africa, right? And then you like bebopped all over the world for quite some time. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, in the e-com space, it's not uncommon for people to be travelers and, and nomads and things like that. But, uh, you know, you go back a few years and that was pretty uh, irregular, you know, to be to be someone traveling like that if it wasn't like uh if it, if it was a digital job, I grew up, uh, so I grew up to missionary parents. Um, I was born in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Uh, my parents were there learning French and, uh, they went to seminary school and had a desire, a calling, I guess, so to speak, what they would say to be in French Africa. There was not a lot of missionaries, um, that spoke French that were there at the time. This is before social media, before all these things happened, you know, and it was really kind of seemed like it was a simpler time where it was really about just um, a place didn't have education or didn't have support and, and you know, people wanted to go there and help. So uh, I grew up, uh, so shortly after Montreal, where my parents learned French, uh, you know, I was in Cameroon, the French part of Cameroon as a kid. I mean, cement hut, no window, no screens. Oh, wow no electricity the true national uh, geographic experience in the bush the bush <laughs> as they say you know and uh i don't think a lot of american uh at least americans like my age can never talk about being without electricity you know it's it's pretty rare uh to to be able to to go and i do have a slight fear of bugs now i won't lie uh just you know it can be pretty traumatizing but no long story short cameroon um botswana a short amount of time in moscow um what I remember the most is essentially my teenage years through 16 years old in uh, the DRC Congo uh, and uh, came back to uh, Kansas City in um, early 2002, 
went to high school for two years, went to Hawaii for four years for college. I got a computer science degree uh, back to Kansas City in 07. And uh, Kansas City has been home uh, since then. So how did you actually get into this e-com stuff? You're, you're bebopping all over. I mean, going to Hawaii for four years, that, that's uh, that was some nice living for four years. And then they go back to Kansas City. How did you end up doing e-com? Was it, did it start when you were in Hawaii because you couldn't get crap out there and you had to order everything in or what what was uh how'd you get into it i took a chance at a startup this was maybe 2000 uh let's say 11 uh i went to a startup in tampa florida we were selling car parts online i was employee number three so it was like an older gentleman that had been good at business he got a web guy and then he got me based on my degree and having worked at mastercard and i that is when i first had my encounter with amazon and ebay um, I was putting these car parts online, contacting manufacturers, distributors, uh, to the point of going into Chrysler Dodge Jeep and taking photos of all their OEM parts, really? and putting them up on eBay, <laughs> cataloging them, uh, concatenating Excels to make, you know, descriptions for 5,000 products at a time. You know, the, really the ones that made Amazon ugly in the beginning, that was me. And, uh, you know, but we did over a million dollars in sales and I was hooked almost from day one of, uh, really thinking about how to create these combos on eBay for trailer hitches and trailer lights and, and, uh, okay, I'll put this together in a package with a blue border on eBay and, uh, I can beat the competition because if I'm bundling it, I'm $30 less than everybody else. And I was just hooked with e-com. I, I didn't know that it was Amazon at the time, um, that really was going to get my focus, but uh, just the idea of being able to work at any time of day, put a product online, maybe in 15 minutes or something, getting a sale. Uh, I was like, this is, and marketology to me is a combination of two words, marketing and technology. And I think e-com sits in the middle of both of those. And I know that's a lot, that was a lot, but uh, how did I get there? For me, it was, um, you know, it was a trial and error. I didn't know it was something I wanted to do right away. I kind of fell into it. And then once I tasted it, I was like, there's no looking back. So you did this for this other person. When did you actually branch out on your own? Okay, so one year there at the startup, did over a million in sales on eBay and Amazon, took a, took a job uh, at a toy company, a medium-sized toy retailer, 300 employees or so, uh, eight retail stores, and I was the e-commerce manager. So I went from like a startup, just a startup employee with no real title, to an e-commerce manager where I was over at a, a small department, and I was getting to work with a uh, inside of a more sophisticated company. It wasn't this private label seller wholesale thing that was really going on at the time that was really growing on Amazon. I was, from another aspect, I was behind a brand, a real company that had brands and trademarks and uh, had a marketing team and a catalog. They were trying to go from catalog being one of the biggest toy catalogs to a to you know being more of an online company and, and because their retail stores were failing. And I was seeing... I do feel like this is a difference for me and a lot of people is that early on, I saw from the inside of a company like that, all the hard conversations that had to be had to really make progress uh, on Amazon. It was customer service, tr treating Amazon like the stepchild. It was the warehouse, you know, fulfillment center needing to prioritize Amazon orders so that we hit our metrics. It was the conversations with uh, accountants and the finance team that were you know, always pushing back because Amazon was two week reporting and they couldn't get good reporting and they hated it. And they didn't want to mess with it um, to the, the graphic and uh, photography team not having bandwidth for Amazon to get me photos and graphics that I needed. They had the catalog and these deadlines to push out. So you talk about having an agency now that, um, you know, works with brands and manufacturers and sellers to do these things. My first interaction with that was from inside a company where there was a ton of resistance, but we, we still did 1.6 million in sales that year. So back to back years, I have these one, you know, million dollar sales years that I'm the only one touching the, the keyboard, the keys, so to speak. So it's like, there's not a lot of things um, out there in jobs where you as a solo person are, are able to tell, I, I made these changes and this happened and I, or I grew this. And that was the case for both of them. And I really realized it was, wasn't, a team thing. This was like, this really was me getting, you know, paying attention to this thing. And, um, I got 20 cent raise that, that year. <laughs> and, uh, it, it was like, you know, I think I got half of it. So it was 400 bucks and the other 400, like later on. And I just had this moment that was like, this isn't going to get me where I want to be. I want to, I want to travel the world. I want to experience new things. I, I honestly, and I wanted to be the best e-com, uh, cause the best e-com guy that there was, I wanted to be the best. And, uh, I wasn't going to get there if they weren't sending me to training and I, these raises and I couldn't get time off. And so that's when I freelance, I started freelancing. Um, 
I'd read a blog, a financial blog that was like, don't just get a second job, which I'm just a worker. I almost work harder, not smarter too often, too often. Okay. I just like, I'm a workhorse, like a blue collar guy in a white collar world kind of mindset, <laughs> how I described myself before. And, uh, I, I, but I, this blog said, double down on what you're, you're passionate about or what you're trying to do in your career, what you're trying to, what you're trying to accomplish. And that kind of just, you know, sparked me a little bit. I didn't have mentors. I didn't have any business people I ever knew. I, I'm, I'm on my own, you know, and I, I was reading this blog and it was like, so I, I got on Upwork, Upwork, you know, freelancer.com, Elance, e and I started finding little Amazon projects. This is like 2014, 2015. Yep. Uh, yes. Before, yeah, 2014. So before yeah. all the agencies, before all the most of the software existed, we, it was in the early days when it was amazing. dot com and people going through, uh, going through that, trying to trying to navigate and figure out their way. You're exactly right, Kevin. And um, I, I personally feel, and I could be proven wrong, but I feel like I was maybe one of the first that was not doing a course uh, that was like trying to do consulting, uh, you know, and there wasn't wasn't anyone out there I was modeling. I didn't come from an agency background. I didn't see, there wasn't a community really at that time. Yeah. Uh, there, there weren't people like really off. No one was saying, calling it Amazon SEO because there was search, find, buy and giveaways and all these other tactics for launching products. People weren't focused on Amazon SEO, you know? And so during this time, um, I started freelancing and I started working on some cool projects and I'd make 500 bucks a weekend or something like that. And these are um, just like individual, know, not big brands or anything, just like individual sellers that just are trying to oh, yeah. figure it out. So it was, it was individual sellers, mainly private label guys need me to help them with a template file or help them with, you know, some, some category restrictions or things like that. But I think I was one of the only, at least U S based consultants on, on, uh, Upwork at the time offering any Amazon services. And all I was saying is, Hey, I'm an e-commerce manager by day. I'm doing a lot of this in my day job. And people would post like kind of what they were looking for. And I think people were choosing me because I was US based and they liked that I had a day job. I'd say, Hey, I know how to do two out of four of these things. I'd just be honest and be like, I'll learn the other two. Like, let me help, you know, but I'm just want to be upfront that I only know how to do two out of four. We'll figure out the other two. Okay. And so I was learning by cranking out these projects really. And, you know, wasn't making hardly anything at the time. Uh, but it was more than a 20 cent raise. And it was like, you know, it was better than bartending every Friday and Saturday and Sunday or something like that, you know, to try to get ahead. And I was loving what I was doing. Well, something crazy happened. So I wasn't amazing at that time. I was just intentional about focusing on Amazon, if that makes sense. I was just, that's what I wanted to work on because I was working on it. I was, I was seeing the results of it, making people a lot of money. And I was just like, this is really cool. And, uh, Upwork bought Elance, right. uh, or, or freelancer.com, maybe both of them, but it bought Elance. And when it did that, it combined my reviews on those platforms and it jumped me up to the top 10 in the world in digital marketing in the digital marketing category. And I was the only Amazon consultant in the digital marketing category. Oh, so, wow. I believe it was a combination of the reviews, right? And like, you know, them putting those systems together, but it essentially jumped me up there. But once I'm up there, I started, I got a few clients like Adidas and Suiza. And uh, they found you, know, you those Adidas, some, and they were, they were fine. They found you on, on Upwork. To me, it's a testament of wow. just, there was no one else doing this. Yeah. Like if, you know what I'm saying? Like if there was, they would be with somebody else. They had a marketing partner at the time. And that was like, I came in kind of like white labeled by then. Okay. And, but I got to talk to Adidas directly and, and in the Adidas project to be specific, it was Adidas had just acquired a company called my coach. It was like that Fitbit smartwatch. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've heard of of it, yeah. Yeah. And they needed help building out their listings. They didn't want help with PPC. So this was A plus pages before everybody has A plus pages, right? This it was, was like called you had EBC to be or something back then or something. Yeah. It was EBC. You had to be vendor central. There was no brand registry for sellers. Um, honestly, is it was like right when PPC came out. So 2015, probably 15, 16. And uh I'm I'm you know, I'm going to town the listings, and what I saw was that's helped direct my company where I do what how I do things now is I saw the value of really good content on Amazon. Adidas had really great content. If you could like Adidas compared to Nike, Adidas is blowing Nike out the water. Okay. On Amazon. Cause they fought with Amazon. Adidas embraced Amazon and you know, Adidas had these beautiful pages and I'd been working with private label sellers, but private label sellers weren't really investing in, in content or listing photos or any of that kind of stuff. A lot of it was just 
take what they've got, get you up there, maybe some supplement companies. Yeah, do it as in. cheap as possible. Find someone on Fiverr to do it for 20 bucks. Well, yeah. I'm a, I'm a data guy that's actually passionate about e-com and this, and you know, I'm, I'm learning the system. I'm loving it. Well, I see the data metrics change whenever I put these A plus pages in place. And I see like these, these great Adidas photography. It was hard for me to ever get that out of my mind for the next, you know, I, I've been building my technology for nine years now. Early on, I saw the, the value of great content on Amazon, whether people believe me or not. I'm like, this stuff is the difference in a great conversion rate or not. So one my technology, like I always knew that from the way I came in, like I just saw the real, the power of really good content. And then two, I saw mismanagement of PPC by this firm that, that Adidas had. And I'm just one of those guys that like, for better or worse, I got to do the right thing. I got to do things the right way. I just, I can't, the shortcuts don't really, I don't even want to try the shortcuts. I want to do it the right way. And I saw them mismanaging this PPC spend. So even though I wasn't hired for it, I was like, I beg, I beg like, eight times basically. And I'm not a beggar, but I was like, can you please just let me like, can you let me just fix this? Like, you know, like, and this is one of the super easy too. This is the bait. I mean, basics of all basics of P- PPC back then. Thank you. Yes. It was very basic. And, uh, they were just, it was like one of these firms where it's like, if you don't spend the money, you lose it in the marketing department, probably like, you know, just like spend it as long as we're spending it, we're okay. Budget allocation or whatever. And I am just like from, a poor family, like you know, you don't misspend money. You see all this waste, away. all this waste. You, you, know. you don't throw away money. Like yeah. who does that? <laughs> like it's, it's ne- that's negligence. That's you know that's my that's bad. So I pushed and uh, I got them to give me their two worst products to manage that that winter. It was a Q four, and I outperformed this firm by like four hundred percent a cost and just all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And uh, you know, it didn't like land me this huge contract or anything like that. But in my mind, it was this validating kind of light bulb of like, Drew, you don't know everything about all of this, but you're like outperforming. You're working for some of the bigger brands of the world right now. You're outperforming any agency that they have there simply because these people aren't even focused on it or trying to learn Amazon. They're just trying to do Google techniques or whatever the case was. And um, so, yeah, you said, was it private label sellers most of the time? But I also worked with some big brands there. And, um, you know, long story short, I got a few private label sellers, a few brands that were like, will you stay on and manage this for us like on an ongoing basis, like 500 a month or $800 a month back then? And, uh, or, you know, I only needed like five or six of those. And I was, you know, I was making a lot more than I was as, a, as an e-commerce manager here in the Midwest. So um, that is the longest answer possible to how I got into the Amazon thing and kind of how I made that leap and went in for myself. But I did have that early background, almost two years as an e-commerce manager um, from inside a bigger company with four brands and really seeing. So then when I started to go sell my technology to these brands, these manufacturers, I like had these conversations. I'd already had some of these conversations internally. Um, and so that was really kind of how I came at it was knowing what kind of conversations they're going to have to have internally and then trying to speak to them about it. And so now today your company has grown. How many, how many employees do you have now? We are, uh, about 45, somewhere between 45 and 50. And you're man, you manage or have a, a say in some of the biggest brands on the planet and what they do in e-commerce and specifically on Amazon, right? Yes, sir. We do. Um, are you are you able to name any of those brands or yeah so you know i'm i'm uh we work with nestle um so nestle would be one of our biggest uh we manage their content uh their their digital shelf um so target walmart amazon um so everything from you know storefronts a plus uh pdp images like you know the whole branding storytelling elements all of that um mayo clinic one of my my personal favorites uh, getting to work with Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic had a, had a part in saving my dad's life uh, when we were coming back from Africa. And so he was there uh, in and out for two years, like as a patient. And, you know, 10 years later, I'm getting to work with them and uh, they have a lot of books. So, you know, author titles and things like that. So we've been working with Mayo Clinic there, you know, uh, all the way down to like Kevin Hart's Bruce and Nikita Dragon's Dragon Beauty. These are influencer bands, Bobby Parrish, Flav City, um, that's been something I've really wanted to learn as we know the off Amazon part is super important. Um, you know, building brands on Amazon, what is that impact of a big influencer pushing it? And so that was a personal, you know, want to learn, want to grow. But those are some of the brands, um, you know, that we've been working with. 
So how is it different working with these big brands versus, like you said in the beginning, you're working with a lot of private label sellers. T today, do you still work with any private label sellers or is it all just primarily the big brands? So not to be prejudiced because I love my community. Okay. I love Amazon sellers. I, we come from the same, you know, background where we're, we're of the, you know, we all want to be entrepreneurs and build our own thing. What it came down to was I wanted to be the best at Amazon. I want to be the best at e -com. I want to be, uh, you know, not saying like I got to be better than you or this or that. I just want to be as good as I can be and really know this stuff. And um, to me, the Amazon seller uh, had like some cognitive dissonance about some things, you know, and I just couldn't. Um, as I started building out my agency and getting work and wanting to not churn clients and keep clients and, and build them and get success, you know, it's like a lawyer. You want to choose winners. You want to have like, you know, a winning record, so to speak, as a, as a DA or whatever. That's kind of how I felt as an agency. If I'm not churning, if I'm picking the best brands or the ones that will be successful, uh, my employees are going to have the better time. My business is going to be healthier. Um, so as the, as the uh, Amazon industry started maturing, the Amazon sellers were just resistant to investing in off Amazon tactics. Uh, they're resistant to uh, investing in content. I think I've been pushing content for three or four years now, if you look at my content way before a lot of other Amazon industry experts. Um, and now everyone's talking it, but for the longest time, um, I couldn't get these sellers to invest in content. It was not something they wanted to invest in. Um, and a lot of other, like I would say like freelancers or graphic designers, they would maybe get hired to do an Amazon project, but they weren't like Amazon experts studying Amazon all day, every day. Okay. So, um, that all that being said, as well as, uh, China being one of the hardest, uh, you know, competitors on the Amazon space uh, in general, like Amazon uh, Chinese sellers, uh, not just for black hat tactics and, and all of that, that you might hear, but they've got biggest, best supply chain access to products, uh, you know, their pricing. And so knowing that a lot of Amazon sellers that really pioneered the Amazon space were private labeling product from Alibaba or you know, going to China and getting product, things like that. Well, that also meant that they're getting it from the source, from someone that can do it themselves at a cheaper price. And so I don't like to lose. So it was like, you know, if I work with American made stuff, for instance, that's product differentiation built in. If I, you know, deal with American manufacturers going, you know, going direct on Amazon, well, they have a great price point. They're going to have the best chance of a good margin and a healthy Amazon store if we get it right. Uh, I have to educate them a bit more and, and it's a little bit slower. But once a manufacturer makes a decision to work with you, they're not changing every two seconds either, right? They're like more long game. And so I just started thinking about the things that like matter to me and the things that I think you need to do to be successful on Amazon. And then I started thinking about some of the major challenges on Amazon, which is like, Chinese price points. So many people buy a product and then there's a Chinese seller selling it for less and they can't lower their price to match them and, and they're screwed, you know? So, um, it was that like, I'm tired of, uh, of trying to convince people of what to do. That's right. And I just want to, I want to build brands and be the best at it. And who's going to, who's going to do that with me? Who cares about all these other things that we can learn together, and push the envelope. And that's really what it was about. Um, so I have, you know, if you're an Amazon seller, and you care about brand, you care about, you know, holistic e-commerce, you care about longevity, uh, you care about building something sustainable, uh, you know, a good business model, you care, you know, you're not a jerk, uh, you know, and, and like you, um, you care about the same things, We're, we can be a fit, right? If you're an Amazon seller, and you're all those things, we can be a fit. Um, if you're trying to build a brand with those things, if not, we're, we're just not really the best fit. We're not going to be the best fit for you if you're just wanting us to change prices and and upload some listings. And, you know, we're brand builders. We're strategists. That's where so, I see a big shift right now on, on the private label side of things is it was marketed in the beginning is like you said, just just find an opportunity, go source it on Alibaba, stick your logo on it and and go to the beach and check your bank account every two weeks and it should be a large deposit. And those days are pretty much over. I mean, they still there's still some people doing that on on some scale, but it's it's not really sustainable long term. You, in, Amazon's been shifting to this with brand registry and emphasizing brands and all the brand content. And you can only get these features if you're actually you know a true brand. So they've been pushing towards that. And uh, it's difficult though because a lot of people don't teach this. It's it's not the quick and easy way. It's a long term. It's a long path. It's a much more expensive path to do it. And like you said, you know, in imagery, it's people eat 
I've, I've always said people eat with their eyes first. And I've been selling FBA since 2015. I've been doing e-commerce for a lot longer than that. But it's always been about the imagery. I mean, I have a partner in one of my businesses that's a photographer, a high-end fashion photographer. So he knows. I mean, I, I've been around this, and I know the value of great imagery, great video, great content. And, and there's not an instant payoff. All, all the time. Sometimes you see it, you know, like you said, you put it up on the A plus content and overnight you can see a difference. But yeah. for, for some people, it's not an instant payoff. So it's hard for them to get their head around that. Why should I spend, you know, I was spending $5,000 plus per day on a photo shoot for my private label brands, uh, you know, custom photo shoots with custom models. And, and that was my business partner in another business giving me a heavy discount, you know, on his rate and yeah. stuff. And other people would look at me, you're freaking crazy. You know, I, I can just go drop my picture and have someone on Fiverr do this for 50 bucks and, you know, drop it in a kitchen kitchen and it'll look fine. I was like, no, it won't. No, it won't. It, that it, conversation, it, I just got tired of that conversation. It, it's like, I got, it's you know crazy. Saying? Like, it, it's like if uh, you say, hey, uh, my price is 250 an hour, you know, as a consultant and someone's like, well, like, are you worth two, like 250? I'm like, I'll pay 50 an hour. Like, you know, like, da, da, da. and yeah. you're like, I, I want to spend zero time convincing anyone of my value, you know, right. in the same time, like, uh, you know, I grew up religious, uh, very religious family that was like, be very, uh, passionate, you know, Pentecostal. So they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're out there. And, uh, I hated pushing Christianity on people. I just hated it. I, you know, if you want to talk about it or you want to talk about, um, you know, Christ or whatever, like I'm, I'm open. I'll talk to you about that, you know, I, at that time, but I hated pushing. I don't like pushing stuff on people, you know? Uh, and I think that might be where some of it comes from, but that's why I was resistant to that, uh, for really just, you know, I, I tried for quite a while. Um, but it's like, look, I'm not going to convince you. I'm not here to debate or argue. I know for a fact, after having done this for so many years that this really, really matters. And, uh, you know, being from a missionary family, I think I'm from a, a family of storytellers. So that aspect of just like, um, you know, storytelling with your content, as well as I'm, I'm, I'm very competitive. I'm very, very, very competitive. I might come off uh, laid back, but I am that person that's never really been seen. That's always trying to win, you know, kind of thing. And uh, so I'm very competitive and, and I'm a gamer. So I was seeing what is the best way to beat a Chinese brand? on Amazon, right? That's what everybody fears. Like everybody's like, oh my God, well the Chinese sellers and like everyone deals with fear. And I just think about like, okay, so what's my pivot? What's my opportunity? What's my, you know, so what's my strength? If their strength is price point, what's, you know, is it quality? Is it, do I do wood products? Like, you know, as, as I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to quit. So I got to figure out how to beat them. It's kind of how I felt. The way to beat them was with better branding. It, so what I found that like the Chinese sellers couldn't do, they can imitate very, very well. They can imitate and copy and like, you know, do product like that. And if it's a simple product, okay. But if I choose this lane that's not super easy to knock off and I'm able to really storytell and create an emotional connection with customers and do kind of what here in the West, in the US, we like to be sold. We like to be emotionally sold on stuff. We like to be, you know, tied to it. That's just our culture. Uh, it's not like that in other parts of the world. I'm not sure everybody knows that if they haven't traveled the world, right? But it's, it's quite a bit different. And I was like, that's our strong suit. That's our angle on, you know, how to build a brand. What we can do better than, than the Chinese sellers in general is, is sell to the Western culture, is brand build, is storytell. And, and they don't uh, understand it. that they, you ask the successful Chinese sellers, like, how do you do this? They, like you said, they can imitate, they can look at the data, but they don't understand what it, they don't understand the TV shows. They don't understand the culture. They don't understand what it, what it want, what, what we want. And people are saying now with like AI, well, the, the, the Chinese sellers are going to have advantages. It's going to be no more, uh, you know, what they call Chinglish or whatever in the, in the listings uh, where it's not, it's poorly written. Now the AI would, but that still doesn't fix the cultural issues and, and knowing exactly how to push those right buttons. Like you said, we, we like to be sold. Uh, we like that emotional connection and it's hard for them to understand that it's not part of their, their culture. Uh, and that's why some things work there, work well there. You know, the, the video, the, the uh, selling stuff uh, via video is huge business in China. It's just not taking off here. Amazon Live and, and all the others that have been trying to do it. It's just, it's not sticking. It's cultural. Um, and, yeah. and you got to, you got to play into that cultural side. And then like you, like you said, you're giving yourself the best competitive advantage with, you're dealing with brands that already have a moat around them that already have. Uh, they, they're willing to spend the money. They understand the long-term value of investing in great content and great marketing. Uh, and it's a whole different animal. But at the same time, dealing with some of these corporations probably 
sometimes you want to pull your teeth out um, because it's it's not like dealing with a private label seller who can who's nimble and can can switch on the fly or, or make a decision really quickly. Sometimes you're like, like you said, you had to go back to them eight times or whatever on that PPC. You're like, come on, this is what we need to do, but you got to get 26 people to sign off on it. And sometimes those people, they're Harvard MBAs and they're Princeton grads and whatever, they think they know everything and they don't know shit. Yeah. And, and so how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, to be fair, when I was talking with Adidas, I was like 25 years old. And I've got a couple of grays now. So <laughs> they got a couple of grays now. And uh, I feel like it is just a little bit different conversation 10 years later uh, in regards to age and in them listening and, you know, the industry maturing and things like that, just in, in that regard. So imagine, Joe, no one was talking about any of this kind of stuff. And you've got this 24 year old from Kansas City, nobody from nowhere trying to tell you how to change your business and do your things like that was part of it. Right. It's just that, that age and experience and maturity. I knew what I was talking about. They just, you know, took them 10 years to listen. Uh, but that's been the story of my life. Uh, but, you know, another thing is Amazon was pioneered by these like techie guys or girls, like, you know, techie people, meaning like you have to be able to figure out the back end of Amazon, Seller Central. And yeah, you had to do supply chains and operations, but it wasn't built by these creative branding types. It wasn't it wasn't pioneered that way. So it was pioneered kind of by the the guy in his basement or the guy on his computer or the guy like, you know, up late at night with China and that kind of stuff. These like creative branding types have been laid to the platform. Okay. Because Amazon didn't give those types a lot of creativity to do any of that stuff. Well, like you said, Amazon is going this way of brand registry and, and Amazon live and Amazon, uh, the TikTok version of Amazon. Now I forget what it's called and, and, and Amazon posts and all these things. I noticed that way back with brand registry one, right? Like 2000, 14, 15 or whenever that came out. Um, if you're actually obsessing about this stuff and you're not just a businessman trying to create an agency because you see an opportunity, which is fine. But if you're actually an operator, like someone that cares about it, likes to tinker, has like figured it all out yourself. Maybe you have a team now, but you did these things yourselves in the early days. Um, it's a little bit different. And I just like when you're working 100 hours a week at the beginning. I'm a little bit more like 60 hours a week now, you know, because I love this stuff. Uh, but when you're working that many hours times this many years, you start to, you're not predicting the future. You're just so in tune with what's going on that you see the trend and where it's going, right? And so that's what I'm getting at is like, I saw this move to content branding. Why? Because I saw a little bit bigger than Amazon. Okay, I saw I saw a little bit bigger, a little bit longer game than Amazon. What has been around since the beginning of time? Storytelling. What what are all the big brands that are successful in the world have in common? They have a great brand, like they have great logos, great assets, a great story, um, and building sustainability and those types of things. Okay, it should be no different on Amazon. Maybe there's a small window of time where you could do that without that and 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 find success, but it's going to come back to what's always been tried and true, which is you know building a good business. Uh, good branding and storytelling elements. Um, don't just build yourself for one avenue, but think about the big picture. How's this work on website? How's this work in retail? How's this work in social? How's everything work together? Um, and sometimes I think too big, uh, but you know, I, I really feel like kind of seeing that and, and as well as the approach of like, what's best from my side at building the agency, what's best for the brand. If I'm being hired to represent them and tell them what they should be doing, uh, my advice should be like not what's easiest, but what's best. And from that from that aspect, as well as you know, I've now worked with four hundred plus brands probably across my career. Um, and the difference in seeing wins, failures, misses, neutrals, being fired, all these lessons that you get from four hundred different attempts, uh, and being like, wow, that one brand really took off and it sold, or or because they had amazing D 2 C site before we started working with them, or or this brand did amazing because they had people searching for their their brand on Amazon because they were in retail, you know. And then once we optimized the listings, boom, it exploded. Or this brand did amazing because our margins were so fantastic because it was U S manufacturing with, with a fast supply chain. Or you start making this kind of list of like what were wins, what worked what worked, you know, and you have this failure list too. And you're like, well, we never got the good photos or we had cheap branding or we had a product that they knocked off before we could get it going. Or, uh, we, we had bad supply chain and, and you kind of just start making this list of like the wins and losses. And for me, um, it was on that side, two more things out of that one, a lot of the private label brands or brands with investors were a struggle for me, uh, because they're, 
what they're looking for, the timelines, the speed, the lack of being able to see what works and then pivot and then see what works and then pivot to get it right, to pivot, to get it right, to optimize, which is what you really need, I think, uh, on Amazon to get a listing really dialed in is several iterations of that product before it's like where it should be. And, uh, you know, investors are like, I need projections and maps. And we have people we have to respond to. And this is even before the aggregators. They're just pushy versus a brand builder, someone that cared to build the product uh you know because out of passion as a family business or like these husband wife teams uh those were the teams that i found a lot more success with than than the than the run quick investor types that i'm like you just it was going too fast the expectations were wrong and we were losing projects whenever uh you know we'd have a relationship here well it's really an investor over here that's 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 guiding the ship or, or calling the shots um and, uh, and to the upmarket stuff I don't know. I, I think it goes back and forth. You have these like Harvard types that are, you know, some of them are very, very scholastically educated and, and uh, you know, they're very smart. There's a, but there's a difference yeah. between smart and being tactical or being gorilla knowledgeable. Um, there's there's a difference. And I think some of it came down to being able to communicate. I had to get better at communicating why I needed them to go against what they had known before. You know, a company like Nestle, they've got a media buying team. They've got a content team. They have all these separate departments inside their company. Well, an Amazon business runs, all those departments are in one. That's what the Amazon marketplace is. You've got PPC and content and supply chain, and they all have to work together. Well, inside a big company, they're all separate, and they don't all necessarily answer to each other or talk to each other. And so you have to know that from the outside, how to communicate with them. Because the content team isn't going to care about PPC or media buying. They're just like, that's not my job, right? At the same time, I struggle or my team struggles with uh, private label sellers where maybe we're still talking to the person that set it up or built it or, or organized it. And while they're smarter um, and able to move faster, a lot of them are hard-headed and won't listen to, to any wisdom or advice from someone that's been doing it 12 years. And so, because they know it, they've done it themselves. Why should I have to pay for something I know I can do myself versus the, 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 the non-private label sellers or founders um, that I feel like they respect our knowledge a little bit more. They respect, they're like, they're not trying to be a do it themselves, build their own business. They simply want to, they're the e-commerce manager, the marketing director that's responsible for the, the Amazon channel. And so while they care, um, it's not something they're trying to learn or do. And so there's just a little different dynamic there when you're like working alongside as a partner. Uh, coaching is one thing because you tell them it, they go and do it, uh, you know, or, or, or that. But if you're a, uh, an agency working alongside a brand, um, you need that collaborative back and forth. You have to be able to respect each other. You have to be able to, um, you know, we're getting paid to give them advice and, and to run their machine, you know, to run their account. And so you need that, um, that trust in your team to be able to, to do your jobs. Right. And so when I'm signing brands or clients or whatever, I'm definitely looking for that kind of like personality, that type of like, you know, who are we going to be working with? Are they going to be able to accept advice from, from females? Are they going to be able to accept advice from my team? Uh, if, you know, if I'm not the one giving it there directly. So I've, I've said a ton, but I'm super passionate about this subject and the way I built it because the, it really does matter. And, I, and I've really been very intentional about the, ch the type of clients I try to work with because um, I want to be I want to win. So how does it work when you work with these big brands? Is it based on it based on a, a like a retainer and a flat monthly fee or is it based on a percentage of sales or if you're doing their PPC as percentage of how much you you change the numbers or a combination of all that or what, what how does it typically work? Yeah, so it's a it's a combination. I try not to make it too complicated in over nine years as someone that somewhat pioneered it I, I feel sometimes like i'm like can someone check my answer on that but like i didn't definitely didn't have anyone that i was asking like well how did you quote your services you know i didn't have anyone <laughs> that i was like well how did you build your model how'd you build your agency that didn't exist for me until much later uh you know 18 19 2019 maybe you know for me at first it was i believed that i started i started i got hired a lot for ppc in the beginning okay so it was out. You could almost build a brand around PPC if you're doing it right because it's affordable. You didn't need to have good SEO or even good images at that time. There was less competition. Great PPC could, could get you going. Um, and I didn't even need search, find, buy, or review manipulation, whatever. If you had good SEO and PPC, you could you could organically rank pretty easily. You could crush it, you know? And so that's what I was doing. Well, um, I started to realize, well, there's all these other things that matter. 
And so, you know, started fixing all those other things too, like as far as like variations and get the price right or get the coupon set up for them or get, you know, uh, get the SEO in the back end and search like all of these other operational things that mattered. So to just do PPC, I had to count on the client or whoever was hiring me to fix those things. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay, I'm going to start doing those things too. Okay, now, you know, then it was like the content piece. Well, can you do that for us? Can you hire someone? Okay, I know that this really matters. If I get the content right, my PPC numbers look way better right? Because the conversion rate goes up. So it was like, well, my PPC results and standards are really relying on this. I can't just focus on this. And so for me, I have built a full service agency because I really felt like you need to be in control of all of these dials uh, to, you know, to really be good, or at least have someone in charge of those dials. You can't just like leave them um, or else I'm not going to be as good as I can be. Like I said, I like to do things the right way and I like to be competitive. I want to, I want to kill it. So I set it up as a full service agency for almost from day one. And except for content, content has come a little bit later. Uh, but and so it, it was like a full service retainer at that time. It was like, what do I need to do to um, get them to say yes, to be able to bite off this budget and then also be able to do all the things we should be doing. As my team has grown, we definitely have a la carte services, you know, as far as like if you want content or you want PPC management or you want SEO listings written or whatever the case, um, we can do that now. But I didn't have a big enough team to be able to have all these different custom ways we were working with people. I was like, you know, it's kind of like this or nothing. Well, as the business has gotten more successful, as I've started some of my own brands, as aggregators have come to the space, as a bunch of different things have happened, it's really changed a lot about what people are open to as well. And um, for us, it was uh, so I have I have profit sharing only. I have uh, where we bring capital and uh, to the brand, and then we split profits 50 50. I have, uh, you know, they they do all their own PPC budgets and, and inventory, and I just get a percentage of sales. We've got, uh, I like to do basically like a retainer with uh, a kicker. So a retainer with profit sharing um, based on profit not just top line sales. So one thing about us, I think that's different is we actually are looking at profitability and helping brands get, you know, more profitable and dial in their numbers and um, figure out their, you know, where we're losing money and where we can gain money and not just growing a business, right? So it's like, let's run a healthy business. Um, and so I love, I love a good uh, incentive, uh, you know, percentage based on if we get results. So like, let's say they're at 10,000 when we meet them, you know, 5% of anything over 10,000 uh, or something like that of profits, right? Plus the retainer. So that's just a little bit safer. Uh, but I've been able to take a lot more risks and try a lot more things as someone bootstrapped uh, that, you know, really put everything back into my business for a very, very long time. Um, I, it just wasn't ways I could take risks with, with a lot of brands, you know, just doing stuff like that. Um, but as I've as we get healthier and a bigger team that I can count on to help me with some of those things, we've definitely got a lot more models going. Um, I, I like it. I, I'm still that kind of ADHD, like to try a lot of different things and see what works. And, you know, there's the patterns of the world out there. There's all these different types of models that have been very successful. Um, I just didn't try those early and, and I'm kind of trying those now. And one of the things that you've deliberately done, too, is you've set your agency up and your business up to give yourself freedom of location. And one of the things that uh, I know you love to do is uh, is to travel. How many countries have, have you been to? Do you know? Yeah, I have been to... I'm 36. Okay. I'm 36 mm -hmm. for, for context. Um, I have been to 67. That's really good. That's about 66 more than most Americans. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm right a, there. That's, that's right. Most Americans, I'm a unique they, bird. Their, their idea of, a, of, a, of international travel is going to Cancun or, or, or taking a cruise in the Caribbean. I, I honestly think this is like the secret sauce. Like if I can just like as a person, person to person, anyone listening to the podcast, Growing up abroad as a kid, um, I definitely saw how other people live on the other side of the world, you know, and, and maybe one of the worst uh, is a fourth world country, DRC, Congo, uh, massive country. The, the country of Congo is half of the United States. So if you put it on a map, uh, on, a, on a real map, it looks smaller, but on a real map, it's half of the United States, um, a massive country with just war, civil war and, you know, hunger and 99% unemployment. So I came back to the U.S. with like an extreme amount of gratitude uh, built in and perspective built in uh, to me as a kid, just being here and being like, wow, I'm so blessed to be here and so grateful to be here. Um, I say that humbly to just say like, that's a secret weapon in entrepreneurship. 
and, you know, just be grateful for every day and like, you know, get your perspective right and keep going. And uh, when, when the failures come or the losses come, just it's all about mindset and, you know, getting your, getting your perspective right. Um, but that all was done for me without my dollar, without my sacrifice. Mm-hmm. My parents took me around the world. Right. So by default, I saw those things and it wasn't vacation, guys. This was like roughing it. OK, this was like I'd never been on a vacation in my life. So I was in my mid 20s. So roughing it like, you know, but I saw I got these gifts. And then uh, later in life, I'm working at that toy company. I got two weeks a year vacation. Uh, I would spend those to go to see my mom in Florida because I'm a mama's boy and I'm just really close to my family. We went through a war together. We're, we're very close. Uh, and I was just like, not happy. I was, uh, working really, really, really hard. Felt like I should have earned my time to be able to travel and see some things, but there's no way I'm going to go into Italy for the first time and not seeing my mom for a full year. It's just not going to happen. Like I, I'm going to be home for the holidays and see her or whatever. So, um, I was like, I have to change something. I have to figure this out, you know? And it wasn't just the finances. It was like, uh, the freedom to go to, to, to choose where to work. And this was, it was not common to work remote at that time. You just, there were, you know, even 2014, it wasn't, no one, not everybody was working home from with a computer, you know? And, uh, so I built my life intentionally to be able to travel because I believe in 2023 and beyond that really travel and experiencing other cultures and other ways of living and, uh, really seeing how, how blessed we are to be here in America for better or worse. You know, we have our own issues, but it's still a lot better than a lot of places. And, uh, there's nothing else that tests you as a man or woman, uh, more than, you know, being in a country, you don't speak this, the language, you don't have a, a plan telling you everything thing to do. You might be driving the other side of the road or public transport and just having to navigate and figure things out and kind of push yourself to be uncomfortable uh, is a secret, is a secret sauce. And especially when you're sacrificing maybe your money or your savings or your time to invest in travel. Uh, anyway, I'm not sponsored by travel. I just, <laughs> I, you know, for me, it's uh, it's the source of my inspiration. It's where I've met uh, most of my closest friends, uh, you know, that I'm still in contact with. Some of the best people I've ever met have been, um, you know, while traveling. And that probably didn't happen till. 28, 29, um, you know, finally being, being able to take like my, my first trip to Germany for like, you know, round trip flight for 300 bucks or something. I found out a deal and started traveling again because between us, when I left Congo, I had guns in my face. My dad was dying. We had been like stopped and halted by, by, uh, the military had to call a friend. I got a friend and, and the government to come and release us to be able to catch our flight. They, they you oh, know, wow. take off, they have emergency landing, pull terrorists off the plane, uh, chaos, you know, Kevin, if I'm being honest. And so for me, as much as I was built into me, there was a part of me that was very much afraid of being outside my comfort zone, you know, uh, of being in a foreign country, uh, again, maybe without my parents doing it by myself or with my sister. Um, but once I, I conquered that again in my late twenties, I mean, I was back. I, I just, you know, fell in love again. I fell in love with it again. I don't know if it's passed down from parents or what, but, um, you know, there's been no looking back. Yeah, I'm the same. I've been to 94 countries. I used to wow. travel. Started my, my first was when I was about 16 or 17. My parents sent me on a trip to with the school. It's like a three-week trip to Europe, and we went to like five countries. That was my f- first. And then I'd been to the border of Mexico since I live in Texas. I think with my parents, but then I, I did a bunch of travel. My mom worked for American Airlines, so I could I had free passes. So when, between mm-hmm. like seventeen or eighteen, when I could go on my own, when I was in college, I went to school at Texas A and M. I would uh, drive to Houston, which is like an hour and a half away or so, and ca- almost every weekend catch a flight somewhere. I just have a blank ticket uh, from my mom, and you know whatever flight back then the airlines didn't control the seats as well, so there's more open seats, and I just. Whatever ha- whatever flight I could get on, whether it's go to Hawaii for the weekend or go to Salt Lake City for the weekend or go to Atlanta or whatever it was, uh, I, I would do it. And then w- one of my businesses, we did a lot of photography, so we we're traveling all over the world doing uh, shooting models and shooting high fashion stuff and everything, and that was cool. But then when I turned 40, I was like, you know what? There's a lot of places I want to go. It just doesn't make business sense to go to. Um, you know, it's I want to go to Bali, but doing a photo shoot in Bali is just not really in the, in the, in the budget. Economical, yeah. uh, and so I'm like, well, I want to go to Bali. So I said, you know, I'm going to take the next year and I'm just going to travel. I set up my business. I had 16 people working for me in a big office. And I'm like, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm leaving for a couple of weeks every, every month uh, for the next year. And I went 
by myself on some trips, some trips I took family or took friends. Uh, but that one year turned into seven uh, because the more you travel, the more you want to know. And so I, I've been all seven continents. I, 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 there's still some places I still want to go. You were talking before we started this. I have a map behind me and another one you can't see that has all the pens uh, of where I've been. And I believe that travel is the best education you could get. Uh, there's, there's nothing better than travel. Life to me is about the experiences you have and the people you meet. And there's no better way to do that than to travel and to take away a lot of your prejudices to see that this world is not all like you. And to also, like you said, appreciate what you have in the U.S. In 2018, uh, 2008, I actually considered like I was tired of a bunch of the crap in the U.S. and it wasn't nearly as bad as some of the things now. And I was like, maybe I'll move somewhere. I, I subscribed to International Living Magazine and I was looking at places and almost moved to Panama, the country of Panama. But then when I made my pros and cons list, I couldn't beat the U.S., even with its issues. And especially as an entrepreneur, I'm like, what's the most important stuff for me? It's running a business, starting a business, being having my own freedom. There's no place else that you can do that better than, you, than the U.S., period, in the, in the entire period. world, P period. period. And so I was like, I need to be in the U.S. And so I, I, that's one of my goals is at some point I want to start a foundation, actually, that actually gifts money to younger people to travel. You know, in Europe, they have that, that, that break year, what do they call it, the, um, we're between like high school and college where a lot of people, they backpack around Europe. But I want to give it to where people from disadvantaged places in the U.S. can actually go somewhere where they don't speak the language, they don't understand the food, they don't know what the heck is going on, because that's true travel. And, and experience that, and, and I'll, I'll bankroll that uh, for them, because it's going to change them for the rest of their life. When you see the news, something's happening in Israel, uh, or something's happening, you know, in the DR or whatever, you've been there, you understand it, you relate to it, you relate to the people. And it's not like it's just seeing it in a movie. It gives you empathy. And, it gives you yeah, it, it, all types of things. You know? I think it's the most important thing anybody can do is, and don't, is to travel and don't just, you know, I, I, one time my parents, they went to China back before China really opened up. And then I went in 2008, I think, for the first time, right before the Olympics. And I came back and my mom was like, how did you like the food? I said, it was, it was excellent. She said, well, when we went, it wasn't that good. All we had was rice and chicken. You know, I said, Would you, where'd you eat? She's like, in the, you know, in the hotel. They said, that's where the safe place to eat is. I'm like, no, no, no. You've got you to gotta get out and eat like the locals and go. I mean, one of the first things I do when I go to foreign countries, I go to a grocery store and just walk. I may not buy anything in there, but just walk up and down the aisles. You can get a sense of the culture uh, and the way they, they live. And sometimes I'd hire private guides in some of my places and just to take me around, just to make things more convenient. You know, I wasn't backpacking necessarily, but they would take me in. By the end of a week-long trip in the Philippines, the guy's like, hey, you're buddies with these people. And they like, come to my house. You know, my, my wife and my 10-year-old daughter, they're going to make a meal. And you sit on some plastic chairs in a tiny little 10 by 10 hut or whatever. And they borrowed, you know, a couple chairs from the neighbor because they didn't have enough. And you sit there and eat a home cooked meal and really experience that culture. You got to get out and do that, and it, it changes your aspects on business, your aspects on life, what's important to you, everything. I, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I would encourage everybody listening to tr take advantage of what you're doing. You're, most of you that are listening to this are Amazon sellers. Take advantage and set up your business so you're not working 60 to 100 hours a week and slate and, and change the desk and get out there. And even if it's for a week a month or a week every three months, get out there and go somewhere, uh, expand your horizons, and it's going to make a huge difference in, in the quality of your life and in your business. I think it's made me a, a, you know, a unique entrepreneur in regards to just like I've been to enough places that I can think so outside the box in comparison to most people that I'm around because I've just seen so many different people living their lives differently that like my ability to see perspectives is, is broadened. It's, it you know, it's heightened. It's, it's, it's by default. So I'm like, look, I can go to college. I can read books. I can do all these things. Um, there's nothing like, you know, uh, you know, I, I landed an Airbnb in a, in a, or something like that in a foreign country. And I, one day I'm walking North, one day I'm walking South, one day I'm walking West, East, you know, I want to be out there in the neighborhood walking around, seeing what's going on. It's I have a buddy that's, that, that tells me, Kevin, you have to look, go down every alley. You know, like, let's just go walk down the street. Like, but you are like, no, what's down this way? And you're like, I'm like, yeah, I want, I want to see. And I think from what this all plays a role in what you're doing for your company. I mean, you're talking about branding and empathy and getting into the getting into the mind of other people. And most people can't do that. They can't actually do that. They can't they can't put themselves. They can't create 
that true branding unless you've experienced a lot of things. Uh, you can create true branding for people exactly like you, perhaps, but there's the world is not exactly like you. Uh, there's a lot of variants out there, and to ac actually do true branding and true brand building, you've got to be multi what was it be the word not multi dimensional multi cultural multi yeah. uh, you know I, I don't know um, there's there's probably some better word but better words for that but it's it's crucial it's crucial it's why I built an agency because for me I could dabble in those things but like I cannot connect with every like you know every, every. so I have a di very diverse team on purpose uh, so that we can come at things from a lot of different angles and perspectives and viewpoints and religious beliefs and cultural beliefs and you name it. It makes us more diverse depending on what projects we're working on. Um, you know, and for me, like what I'd say to the audience is like, I'm from a family of five that made like 26,000 a year, like here in the U S right. So, uh, as much as I got to travel on missions work, which was a completely different perspective, you know, you're, you're out there. Like I really saw, um, you know, evil and struggle and, and all that kind of stuff, just like in the world in, in Africa. Um, but, but you can get to that, you can have a life where you're able to travel and, and, and have a high quality of life. Um, and without that, I built it for myself from nothing. I'm bootstrapped. Uh, you know, I paid for my own college. I've like, I've crawled my way up. I, I wanted it. I was in my mind that I wanted a life where I would be able to travel. And I knew I didn't want to travel without being able to take care of my family first. Welcome to episode 341 of the AMPM podcast. My guest this week is Andrew Morgans. Andrew grew up in Africa, but lives in the U.S. now. He's done quite a bit of travel. had not been to quite as many countries as I have, but he's, he's pushing it. He's been to 60 some odd. And today he's one of the top managers of some of the biggest brands in the world when it comes to Amazon, from Nestle to one of the, he got to start with one of the divisions of Adidas, uh, a huge uh, plethora of big name brands. And he is the caretaker for everything they do on Amazon. We're going to talk about that, talk about travel, talk about a whole bunch of really cool stuff in this episode. And don't forget also the Billion Dollar Seller Summit is coming up in June, June 11th to the 15th in San Juan, Puerto Rico. You can go to BillionDollarSellerSummit.com and get information on that. Hopefully I will see you there. But in the meantime, enjoy this episode with Andrew. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host. Kevin King. Ke 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 Kevin King. Andrew Morgans, welcome to the AMPM podcast. It's an honor to have you here today. It's an honor to be here. You know, we recently connected and got a chance to meet each other and share a meal. But I have obviously known of, of your conferences and your events and uh, obviously your expertise for a long time. So I'm honored to be on the show. I appreciate you coming on, man. I knew your name, but I hadn't put a, a name to the face. Then, like you said, yeah, we were at the out at Prosper, and uh, we went to uh, we got invited to a dinner. I think Paul Barron uh, organized this dinner at this uh, Bazaar Meets, which was a cr welcome to episode three hundred and forty one of the AMPM podcast. My guest this week is Andrew Morgans. Andrew grew up in Africa, but lives in the U.S. now. He's done quite a bit of travel. had not been to quite as many countries as I have, but he's, he's pushing it. He's been to 60-some-odd. And today, he's one of the top managers of some of the biggest brands in the world when it comes to Amazon, from Nestle to one of the—he got to start with one of the divisions of Adidas, uh, a huge uh, plethora of big name brands and he is the caretaker for everything they do on amazon we're going to talk about that talk about travel talk about a whole bunch of really cool stuff in this episode and don't forget also the billion dollar seller summit is coming up in june june 11th to the 15th in san juan puerto rico you can go to billion dollar seller summit.com and get information on that hopefully i will see you there but in the meantime enjoy this episode with andrew Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? 
I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Kevin King. Andrew Morgans, welcome to the AMPM podcast. It's an honor to have you here today. It's an honor to be here. You know, we recently connected and got a chance to meet each other and share a meal. But I have obviously known of, of your conferences and your events and uh, obviously your expertise for a long time. So I'm honored to be on the show. I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I knew your name, but I, I hadn't put a, a name to the face. And like you said, yeah, we were at the, out at Prosper and uh, we went to uh, we got invited to a dinner. I think Paul Barron uh, organized this dinner at this uh Bazaar Meats, which was a crazy, crazy place to, uh, to, to go and eat. Uh, and then uh, you and I were sitting next to each other and we, we started chatting. And we're like, holy cow, man, we got we to gotta get on each other's podcasts. Uh, you host a podcast as well, or you're, you're a co-host, I guess. You got a few others uh, uh, all about e-com. What's the name of that podcast? Startup Hustle. Startup Hustle. So uh, for the Amazon community, um, I am one of four hosts. We, we, you know, we post, uh, five days a week. So my episodes come out on Tuesday. We, I cover all things, e-commerce, Amazon startups, you know, software, uh, just all the stuff we're doing and, and loving in e-com. Um, but there's a couple other hosts there that co- cover just like software startups, um, uh, nonprofit and, and minority owned businesses. So we kind of cover a variety of topics. Uh, we were at one point we were, uh, top 15, uh, business entrepreneurial podcast in the world, I think last year. So, um, it's growing. It's a lot of fun and, and I'm excited to get you on there as well. Awesome. Yeah. I love to love to come on. Uh, we'll, we'll make that happen. So you've got, you know, you had an interesting background and you were talking, uh, when we met at dinner, like you grew up in Africa, right? And then you like bebopped all over the world for quite some time. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, in the e-com space, it's not uncommon for people to be travelers and, and nomads and things like that. But, uh, you know, you go back a few years and that was pretty uh, irregular, you know, to be to be someone traveling like that if it wasn't like uh, if, it, if it was a digital job. I grew up uh, so I grew up to missionary parents. Um, I was born in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Uh, my parents were there learning French. And uh, they went to seminary school and had a desire, a calling, I guess, so to speak, what they would say, to be in French Africa. There was not a lot of missionaries um, that spoke French that were there at the time. This was before social media, before all these things happened, you know, and it was really kind of seemed like it was a simpler time where it was really about just um, a place that didn't have education or didn't have support and, and, you know, people wanted to go there and help. So uh, I grew up, uh, so shortly after Montreal, when my parents learned French, uh, you know, I was in Cameroon, the French part of Cameroon as a kid. I mean, cement hut, no window, no screens, oh, wow. no electricity. The true National uh, Geographic experience. In the bush. The bush, <laughs> as they say. You know, and uh, I don't think a lot of American, uh, at least Americans like my age, can ever talk about being without electricity. You know, it's, it's pretty rare uh, to, to be able to, to go. And I do have a slight fear of bugs now, I won't lie. Uh, just, you know, it'd be pretty traumatizing, but no, long story short, Cameroon, um, Botswana, a short amount of time in Moscow. Um, what I remember the most is essentially my teenage years through 16 years old in, uh, the DRC Congo, uh, and, uh, came back to, uh, Kansas city in, um, early 2002, went to high school for two years, went to Hawaii for four years for college. I got a computer science degree uh back to kansas city in 07 and uh, kansas city has been home uh since then so how did you actually get into this 